your families. I'm Emily Penrod, your family relationship coach. In this program, we address six areas of health for families, emotional, financial, mental, physical, social, and spiritual. And my guest today is Beth Cochran. She is a mother who has raised children with special needs and grown from the experience. Now, this has a special place in my heart. I, I was a special ed teacher for 24 mm -hmm. years and I saw these parents and what they went through and what they sacrificed for their, their children. And so now to be able to talk to one who has been through that, I know she has some valuable, valuable content, golden nuggets to share with us. So Beth, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And what can you share about your journey? What can I share? Oh, my journey. My journey started um, 25 years ago with my younger son, uh, who was born and considered failure to thrive. Um, we didn't really know why. We just knew that he was struggling to grow and would turn blue when he cried and um, had to be held certain ways when he was fed and just needed a lot of that extra TLC and than a typical baby would need. And um, when he was about four months old, he got really sick, ended up with RSV. This was over Christmas time. And each day he would get a little bit better, but at each night he would severely regress. And so we had one special nurse, her name was Ruth, and she was our night nurse and she was a godsend. And I was usually the one staying the night with him because my husband was still trying to work during all this time. My mother had come to get our older son who was almost three or had just turned three at the time. And here I was in these very dark, lonely nights um, while, you know, spending the night in the hospital in a chair <laughs> in my little one's room. And um, it got really, it, it got dark, like dark things come to your head. And there were some very bleak moments. And on night number 10 of RSV not getting better. Now, most children are going home by day 10 or at home and getting better and, and well on the mend. And he was not getting any better. Um, I, I, I lost it. I, I came out at about 4 a.m. to the nurse's station and just said, you guys have to do something because I can't do this anymore. I don't know what to do, but I, I can't do this. And it was just my total, like, let it all down, let the tears come, let it go. It had been 10 days of me stifling all of this and being brave and, you know, all of the things. And the night nurse Ruth came in and said, I'm telling you something's going on with this kid. I really wish they would investigate further. She said, first thing in the morning when the, when the ENT's office opens, I am calling the on-call doctor and I am asking him to come in and scope this little guy. And um, she was our angel because she knew that something was not right within his airway. Part of that was because of her own experience. She had been in a car accident several years prior and had been traked for a few days while she was in recovery. And she said, I know that there's something going on with his airway. I know it. Now it's just God speaking with her. And during all of this time, you know, people kept asking me, what's, what's getting you through this? And I'm like, it's only the grace of God because my, 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 uh, adorable three-year-old son. I haven't seen him in well over a week. We just went over Christmas. We sat here in the hospital the whole time. My husband can't be here with me. He's working. Every night gets worse. Every day gets a little better, but it, it all starts. It's just this ugly, vicious cycle. And the only thing that's getting me through is the grace of God. And um, so the ENT came in the next morning, first thing, and took him to the OR and scoped him. And they all kept telling me, you know, oh, it won't be a big deal. He'll come out and tell you what's going on. Well, he didn't come out until about an hour later. And he came out and talked to my husband and I and said, well, I traked him. He has no airway. He's had no airway. 
And we believe that an airway may have been created at birth because they had to bag him a lot when he was born. Um, the, the theory was that he was, that, that when they bagged him when he was born, that it created a little tear in a bunch of tissue that was over his vocal cords. And that's what saved him. And so for this whole time, he was breathing through a two millimeter slit through tissue that would flap open and closed, which explained why we could hear him breathing at night. And the nurses were gathering around us, consoling us and telling us they were so sorry. And we were just like, thank you, Lord. We knew, we knew that that would save him from the struggle of daily just breathing, just being able to breathe. And we were so elated. And all of a sudden the nurses are like, why are they so happy? <laughs> Are they so happy? And so I look back on this and I've continued to look back on it, even from hours after this happened going, why were we crazy? We knew that a trach would help him to breathe. That's where he was struggling. And literally within two, two days of him getting his trach, he was released from the hospital. So from that point forward, we had found that he had very thick web tissue over his vocal cords he required over the next two years, at least 20 surgeries to repair the, um, to cut out the tissue, but then also to repair scar tissue that would create. And it was like, you know, one you're, you're fixing one thing, but creating another. And it was kind of a vicious cycle, but we were also told that he would not um, probably walk, talk or be normal um, because of, the possible damage to his brain and body by potential lack of oxygen. They had no real proof about any of this, but they it was just the theory that I was given by a couple of different doctors saying, don't expect much from this kiddo. And so we got him involved right away in early intervention. He was receiving therapeutic services for occupational therapy, physical therapy. He had in-home nursing, um, you name it, we had it. And the in-home nursing only came a couple times a week. I was basically his nurse. And back in those days, we didn't have the program that they have now where parents can get paid to be their child's provider. And we would have been a perfect candidate for that because he was 24 seven care. We couldn't leave him with anyone unless they were trained to take care of the trach or if something happened. Um, I was, we had therapy at least three days a week for him. Um, by the time he was three, he was running, he was playing soccer. He was, he had well over 50, 60 signs that he was using and he was trying to talk. Even, even after getting his trach out at two years old, he, he still was only saying about 10 true words by the age of three. So he got his trach out right, right before he turned two. Um, he was supposed to have a full tracheos or tracheal reconstruction right before he turned two. And they went in to do this major surgery that would have been grueling at best to recover from. He would have been required to be sedated for over two weeks, laying in a hospital bed for recovery. And they, the doctor went in and scoped him and said, oh my goodness, he's grown so much. We're not going to need to do this. Once again, another a blessing. by the grace of God. Um, he also said, I am so impressed with how well he is doing developmentally. He said, it's going to take him years to catch up with speech, but he said, I'm not concerned about your son's future. He said, those other doctors didn't give him a chance before they tried to convince you that he wasn't going to make it, it to be a, a functional human. Again, another praise God. Um, and he, he, he gave me all the credit for all the hard work that I had done and that my husband had done to help him and, and our older son. And I said, no, this is all God. You know, this, th it, there's no other explanation for it. And during those days, I was not the type to say that, that this is God, but I did. And it just came out. And, and it started coming out easier and easier at that point, because it was, it was, only because of the grace of God and the power that he gave us and the stamina that he gave us. And he kept our marriage together um, by giving my mom the stamina. Every time my, my little guy had surgery, my mom was there to take our older son. I mean, it, it took so much more than just that miracle. You know, there was, there was definitely a team rallying around us. 
Um, so he had therapy until he was about 10 years old and said, mom, I'm done. I, I don't want any more. Um, he had a few more surgeries up until about 16 or so. Um, but he is a highly intelligent, fully functional. He played competitive soccer through high school and, you know, middle school and is, uh, a very functional, capable human being, um, extremely smart, and has basically showed all those doctors they were wrong. So <laughs> um, if that's not a miracle in its own, I don't know what is. Um, my older son later was di diagnosed with um, a tick disorder. Um, so that's a mild special need that does take a lot of um, focused eye from parents to know how to handle, deal with, intervene with others, things like that. And when our boys were four and seven, we brought in a, a little foster girl who was five months old, who was later in our care diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome. And um, later when she was about seven years old, uh, diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, we did adopt her when she was about two before we knew kind of what what was really truly happening and that happens a lot because time is what helps people figure out what's going on with their kiddos when they come in with such significant trauma so that then led us into a whole nother realm of special needs <laughs> um definitely a lot of um developmental delays like we had dealt with our son but a lot of her delays also dealt with trauma that we had um, no experience with, you know, we had no experience with not knowing what kind of trauma she had experienced. We knew a little bit, um, but we didn't know a lot. And we still to this day, 21 years later, don't, don't know the full story, but we know enough to know that it was not pretty in that five months that she was with her birth family. We do know that prenatally, she experienced a lot of trauma, um, alcohol, drugs, domestic violence, um, you name it. So that opened us into a whole nother world of special needs and mental health that we had never experienced any of this in any of our close loved ones or close friends before. And 20 years ago, there wasn't a lot known about it professionally. No, even, even three to five years ago, they've come a long way in about three to five years, but it's, it was a long road. Um, so at about seven, she was uh, diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder, which is a very, um, a very bleak and hopeless diagnosis. I'm familiar with it. Yes, it is. So yeah, it's a very tough one. And, and we were seeing a, a specialist who understood and was highly trained in that disorder, as well as having raised a child of her own that she had adopted with the disorder. Um, and she kept saying to me, I wish we could have had you here four years ago. Four years ago, I was crying for help when she was two and three and saying, this isn't improving. It feels like it's getting worse and things would wax and wane and it would get a little bit better and it would get a little bit worse and it'd get a little bit better and it would get a little bit worse, but the worse always compounded the better. The worse always was worse than the worse before the better would be okay and it would last. But as she got older, those better spells got shorter. Mm. And it usually was a lashing after the fact by worse. Um, we didn't know how to, we didn't know how to parent her. We, mm. we, we didn't know you have to parent these kiddos different. Very differently, yes. Yeah, and, and by the time we learned this, there was no turning back. It was just too late. Um, by then we she was, 10 or 12 years old and it was just too late we had a foundation under us where she was brought into a typical family with typical bonded scenarios between each person and the family and had we have known that that's what she needed maybe we could have approached her differently but we didn't know to not expect her to be a family member why else would we have adopted a child? We wanted a child we could love yeah. and, and who needed a, a loving, nurturing family. We didn't know she needed a family that was sterile and robotic and non-connective. And, and that's, in the big picture, the mistake that was made. 
That's the heartache. Yes. That's heartbreaking. Um, we, we ended up taking her to a boarding school after a series of very traumatic events within, within our family, um, specifically her and, um, and never, never would I ever want to portray that she is to blame for anything that happened because she was a child who didn't know how to deal with her trauma. And we were a family that didn't know how to deal with her trauma. And, um, basically the information we were being given was the the best way to help her was to remove her from our family because when she would be in the psychiatric unit or the hospital or residential treatment she would do very well primarily because a there was no history in that dynamic of past behaviors past issues things like that but there also was no family dynamic in in her everyday world where she was expected to be a part of that. Um, and even though we had pulled back from expecting, you know, an I love you back or a hug or anything that way, we were still loving each other and she was in the home. And so that was not good for her. Um, so it was highly recommended by our amazing therapist to find a boarding school for her. Which and is we difficult. did. Yes, yes, it is. Um, and we um, found an amazing place for her to go. And we cautioned them that we were very concerned about her inability potentially to have a relationship with us and to please don't push that on her. And the first few months they pushed it on her twice. And we had to remind them, please don't because one time she had gotten herself in a lot of trouble. And I was like, you know, what? our goal is to keep her here safe and and help her move forward from the from where she is not from what we expect not from what you expect our goal is for her to to become an adult safely and and to be a functional adult and in the cycle she was in that that likely would not have happened so yeah. we finally got them to kind of back off of talking about phone visits and writing letters to us and things like that. And from that point forward, from what we're aware of, she flourished and, and did very well. Um, there has only been a couple of points of contact since then. She's, um, we took her at 14. She's now almost 21. Um, so that's a mixed bag as well when it comes to where are we in our healing with all of this as a family? And 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 I think of her often in her healing. Um, I am at peace, but it's still difficult. It's still tricky because we raised this child. We loved this child. Um, we brought her into our family as, as a family member. You know, I remember telling my parents and they were like, we'll love her as our own just like any other grandchild oh yes and same with my husband's family and um it just it's different when it's like the death of a child but the child's not passed yes yes yeah the loss so, of a relationship you had hope. yeah yeah but from my understanding she's doing well and you know we've had to reframe what We've had multiple times with each of our kids had to reframe, reframe what is success. Mm, yes. what is, and it looks different for all three of them. And our original goal when we took her to boarding school was a, just get her to 18 safely. Please let her be a functional adult. And that happened. Mm. And we're, we're, we're happy about that. Um, Unfortunately, there it's highly unlikely there will ever be a relationship with her, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean we don't love her and don't care because we do deeply. Yes. It's just not safe to do that for us, for our kids, for her. Yeah. And I, when I say our kids, I mean, that includes her. Yes. Yeah. So that, that's been, you know, a lot of our journey. Um, I still see some special needs in, in both of my kids. You know, trauma is in them as well. They've ex they experienced some things and witnessed some things in in our house as young teenagers and and teenagers that they that no sibling should ever have to see. Mm -hmm. um, 
they've been they've been products of accusations and you know the ambulance at the house and mom being gone every monday or thursday night for therapy and not at their whatever um dad scrambling to get them where they need to go and working and trying to keep us all together and you know once a special needs family always a special needs family even when your children are now functional adults that that will always be there Mm -hmm. And so even though my kiddos are, are happy, healthy adults, all three of them, to my knowledge, um, they all still have special needs and, and yes. they've all had some experiences that no kiddo, no family should have to experience. Um, on top of that there, you know, my husband has had some major health issues for about the last 14 years. So they were experiencing all of that during the time that our daughter was peaking in her mental health needs and things like that. So we have had an awful lot on our plate. And again, I think we, we just continue to point it back. Thanks be to God, because mm -hmm. it's, it's how we're still together. It's still, it's how we are as close as we are with our older kids. Um, it's, it's how our marriage has gotten stronger. It's how we have peace, even though there's still pain in that peace. And, um, it's, it's the only answer I have about five years ago, probably six years ago. Now I ran into two other ladies. I, I met, um, through, by God. Um, one of them was a phone call that was given my name to support her as a, a mom raising a child with reactive attachment disorder, looking for help, support, a connection, an ear, anything. And we talked for two hours. And shortly after that, she stumbled upon another mom locally. And they always say that RAD is rare and it's not. Um, it's actually quite prevalent in children who have been involved in foster care or um, had medical trauma, anything like that. And um, come to find out over time, we counted about 20 women within our school district who were moms of children with this disorder. Wow. Yeah. So the three of us ended up um, creating a nonprofit for families who are re raising children with reactive attachment disorder. And um, that nonprofit supports families um, through advocacy and um, just sharing connections and resources with them about um, different options and different courses that they can take. And when I mean courses like paths, they can take to figure out the best resolution for their family to bring their whole family to safety, not just the child who is experiencing reactive attachment disorder, because this disorder becomes a family disorder, even though there's sure. one person yes, diagnosed. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So that's that's the gist of the nonprofit. It's it's safety for the whole family and for every family that may look different. And with whatever decision that family makes, there's no judgment in that. Um, which for some that's very difficult because some families end up relinquishing their children mm -hmm. because it becomes such a legal safety issue for that child and for their family that that is the only option. And so there's a lot of grace given mm -hmm. and a lot of judgment-free zone given there. Um, I'm no longer involved with the nonprofit. I just, I got to a point where I needed to let something go. Mm -hmm. And it was one of those things that was just weighing on my heart. And I know that leaving was very difficult for me and still is at times, but I think it was also very freeing in a lot of ways because I'm not continually hearing these traumatic stories. Mm -hmm. And then my brain doesn't start going where it could have, where of the what ifs, what, what yeah. could have gone or what yeah. is she doing? And I found myself worrying more about the things that did happen and about her than I needed to. And it started consuming me. So I, I let that go and the nonprofit is flourishing and doing very well. And that's something that it's, it's the, what is the name of this nonprofit? Called Rad Advocates. Rad, Rad Advocates. Advocates. Yeah. Okay. They can be found at radadvocates.org. Um, they do amazing things. Their, their number one goal is to advocate and educate 
um, families. And when they're, when they do that, they're also advocating for families and what the family wants and needs, but they're also educating them on the, on the different paths they can take, um, different options. They connect them with other resources, but they also get involved in meetings with schools, CPS, whoever, um, to help educate those professionals on what RAD really looks like in the home, because they don't truly get it. They really don't. And they are bound by a system that's very broken yes. and that's guided by money. And RAD takes a lot of money and a lot of time for there to be a chance for a child to heal. And I think if there's, there's anything that I wish I could have, you know, had that magic wand, it would be the resources that we could have potentially, you know, had a treatment, a, a treatment facility for a couple of years to help that we you know who has that kind of money yeah, um, yeah. the rich of the rich do um and so unfortunately we don't have that but um you know you look back at the what ifs what could we have done different what could we have done if we had unlimited money things like that but um unfortunately the best treatment center that was around at the time is no longer and um yeah but they've been very supportive to us and, and part of how we got started. So it's just been a lot of things that we see God's hand in that helped us create that nonprofit. And they got have, you through this. I mean, I'm just yeah. looking at everything your family yeah. has been through yeah. for the past, what, 25 years, did you say? Yeah, our son is 25. Wow. wow. Yeah, 25 years ago, actually coming up in December, it will be 25 years when all of this started as far as our special needs journey. We were, you know, we joke all the time. We were just these two American kids, you know, just happy go lucky and had never been impacted by anything really. And here we were, boom, you know, um, well, but we have this kid and here we are <laughs> 25 yes. years later. Well, so. and, and you, you bring up to me something I firmly believe that we need to support families. You know, I, I don't like that always it takes a village to raise a child. I prefer it takes a village to support the parents Absolutely. so they can raise their children. And we need that family unit. You certainly did all you could mm -hmm. raising those three children. Right. And I love that you're taking this pain, this what you went through and using it to help other families. Right. So you you you're not so involved in the nonprofit, but you helped start this nonprofit. Right. And it's radadvocates.org. And then what are you doing now with <laughs> I know you've had to you've had yes. to, an, a, an ailing husband to care for in addition to the children, but what are your plans for the future? Well, um 13 years ago, I ended up in a job as a case manager for children with special needs. That was another piece of the load, um, which I loved. I loved connecting with those parents and those families because, yes, you're right. As caregivers, we need the village. We need the village and we need the circle of support. And that's one thing that I found a lot of my, I, I call them my mamas, um, you know, whether they're my rad mamas or my special needs mamas. Um, they they were so isolated and so alone and that's how I felt and it was a way for me to not only help these mamas get their kiddos into an early intervention and get them therapy and get them resources and started because I was the birth to three program this is the birth to three kiddos and they're the ones that really these mamas are, are going from their dream of this perfectly healthy normal uh -huh. child to potentially not and that is so heartbreaking and so hard for some moms to really work through and um I I definitely loved supporting them through that and you know I would have a kiddo who just was maybe walking late something that would be on a mild scale of special needs all the way up to a a kiddo with um, a significant diagnosis and potentially not not viable to live you know mm -hmm. a a healthy life so the whole gamut falls under special needs in that zero to three category and um so I did that for 11 years quit my job two years ago 
this week and um, joined my husband full-time in real estate. So I'm still using my social work every day, <laughs> um, even though it's not with my special needs families per se, it's still with something that is highly charged in families' okay. lives. You know, lots of money, their mm -hmm. home, their dreams. You're still um, supporting families. I'm still <laughs> supporting families. It just looks different. Um, mm -hmm. I do have to say though, I, I do enjoy it. I miss the special needs niche and that bond between those, those people, but I do, I do enjoy what I do and I love the flexibility that I have with it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't know for sure that working with special needs family is, is completely gone. It still is a calling for me. Um, I don't know what that's going to look like, um, but I, I am going to be enrolling in a coaching class sometime in the next year. And I look forward to applying that somehow. I don't know if that will be coaching per se, um, but I look back in my life and I, I, <laughs> I've been coaching my whole career. You know, I started as a, a babysitter and a nanny in elementary, you know, late elementary, middle school, high school, and morphed into a social work degree, which then, you know, I did home daycare to raise my own children and, and be home with my special needs son and, you know, had two special needs kiddos that needed a mama who could advocate for them. And all of that was coaching. Mm -hmm. And, um, oh, yeah. you know, my, my case manager job was coaching what I'm doing now is coaching. And so I, I'm, I am going to pursue the certificate because I, I want to be sure that I'm refining my skills and I'm doing things the, the right way. I mean, I don't know that I'm doing it right. I, I feel that I'm good at what I do, yes, but I want to refine my skills. And so I do believe that at some point I will be called back somehow into a special needs something. Yeah. Um, I just don't know what that's going to look like. And, and it will probably, you know, still involve me being involved with my business as well. I just don't know, know how this is going to look yet. God You're knows and I don't. So Staying open and ready to do his will. Exactly. I so. love it. Yeah, it's exciting. It is beautiful. Yeah. Well, I know you're on Facebook. And yes. if someone wants to learn more, talk to you, connect with you, mm -hmm. is, is Facebook the best way? Facebook really is the best way right now since I don't have a business per se, um, you know, at this point, you know, I, I have our real estate business, but that's different. So Facebook really is the best way. They can certainly reach out to me on Messenger and just let me know how they found me. I do have my Facebook fairly buckled down, so I don't typically friend or or acknowledge people that I don't know in some way or I don't see a connection to by people that I know. But if anyone wants to message me um, on Messenger, they're more than happy to do that. You can find my, my profile on Facebook. It's under Beth Cochran. Um, you know, I typically have a picture of my face on it, so you'll know it's me. Um, but just send me a message. Let me know where you, where you found me and how you found me and we'll connect that way and go from there. I'm more than happy to be an ear, um, support whatever I can do to help. I would be happy. Obviously to you have been doing that for decades. Survey you yeah. Can get. So send a message to you along yeah. with that friend request. Right. Yeah. Definitely. Definitely. Idea. Yeah. Ben, thank you so much for joining us so, and sharing your powerful story. That is so heartwarming. I. Yeah. I applaud you for all you have done to help strengthen your family, help your family members and so many other families as well. Thank you, truly, I appreciate that. You are doing a great work, truly. Thank you. Thank you, and for my viewers, join me again next week at the same time. Until then, love yourself, love your families. Let's make the world a better place by strengthening families. I'm Emily Penrod with HealingYourFamilies.com.